Hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman. We're with Wikibon.org and this is theCUBE. SiliconANGLE's production of this year's VMworld 2013. We're live at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. We're in Moscone South at the street level. Come into the lobby, take a right, you can't miss us. Uh, VMware has set up this awesome space for us. Really can't thank them enough and all of our sponsors here this week. Uh, this is the software-defined storage uh, deep dive. It's a, it's a spotlight that we're doing on software-defined storage, SDS. You know, at Wikibon, Stu, we call it software-led storage, software-led infrastructure. Chris Greer is here. He's the chief engineer and, of enterprise architecture at FedEx Services, which comprises IT marketing and sales. Is that right, Chris? Welcome that's, to theCUBE. That's right, thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, pleasure having you. Really appreciate you spending the time here. I mean, this is a great event for practitioners like yourself. Uh, 10 years, uh, this is your first VMworld? <laughs> uh, this is my fifth VMworld. Fifth, uh, fifth VMworld. So, you know, it's a show that was started for, for practitioners and it still has that you know, deep practitioner the feel to it, so I'm sure there's a, 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 well, how do you spend your time here? I mean, I'm sure people say, you know, sharing ideas, stories, talking to peers, I, I, I would imagine similar for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and networking, meeting other people in similar situations, uh, kind of getting their take on how they've solved problems, uh, seeing all the different vendors and seeing what's coming to market, seeing you know, what's new, uh, and, and seeing how this would play and how it might benefit one of our many different kind of areas that, uh, problems that we have in IT. So let's talk by ta start by talking about FedEx. I mean, it's an amazing company, and you guys are just going to continue to innovate you know, we hear you know the, the the post office is getting pressure to to, to stop being, stop delivery on Saturdays, and you guys and Amazon are trying to get you know same day delivery mm -hmm. and Sunday delivery, and, and it's just it's it's phenomenal how that you know, the logistics complexity <laughs> that you guys manage and how it's you know, affected everyday everyday lives with e-commerce and, and in particular. But um, talk about some of the drivers in your business, some of the challenges that you face, some of the pressures that uh, your, your executives and your lines of business are putting on you? So uh, as far as challenges go, you know, uh, Amazon has been, you know, and the e-commerce explosion has really been a huge benefit to our business. But uh, contrary to what they offer, there's no such thing as free shipping. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're still working on uh, cost is always a concern. And as we grow out and as we are uh, an international organization, we're global. We service 220 countries and territories around the world. And not uh, the challenges of uh, technology and that kind of a space and all the different regulations and things we have to deal with. It's a very complex working with a, an airline and a huge trucking company, a retail presence, and we have all of that. So those are the big challenges that we look at. How do we do architectures that can be similar and bring this together so we can have one seamless experience for our customers? So what do you try to be best at? I mean, you got, you got cost, you got availability, and you got speed and agility. It's, it, 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 can you be the best at all three of those, or do you have to make trade-offs? Uh, it's a difficult challenge, but that's why we have the organization that we have where we look at these and we try and balance them. Uh, of course, we need speed. That's kind of baked in our DNA. Uh, but reliability, we can't sacrifice that either, because that's what our customers expect of us. So we treat our IT, our culture, is more around making sure that we can deliver that same FedEx experience in, in IT and deliver those services the same way we do to our customers, because that's what they depend on us. So talk about the services that you're involved in. Is it organizational wide? Are you sort of narrow on a particular line of business? Talk about that a little bit. Uh, my role is in enterprise architecture. So we sit back and uh, we get to go and look at these standards and, and build the architectures for anything from hardware to software stacks and things that we look at using all throughout the business. Uh, my particular role has been the lead architect for virtualization at FedEx since we've done this about six years ago. Uh, and going in that, we, we, the problem scopes are pretty much uh, where we use uh, technology. Chris, I'm wondering if you can, if you cover virtualization for such a large environment, you know, what's your take on cloud and, and software-defined data center as VMware has put out recently? You know, it sounds like you're heavily virtualized, you've got a lot of locations, you, you probably act almost like a service provider to your internal organizations. Walk us through how, how, how your thoughts are as to those environments. Yeah, for us, we've been in this journey for a little while. Uh, we are about 80% virtualized now at this point. Uh, and we've been, it's an interesting transition as we see this going through. Uh, virtualization has really changed the data center overall. And, and, and cloud is that layer of automation doing that on top. And it's really kind of enabled our end users and, and lets IT kind of get out of the way of the business. It's kind of what we've positioned it as. We have got a big private cloud internally uh, and looked at other options of uh, what our, the other options are out there. Uh, you can imagine a business like ours, we are a bit seasonal. So there are options to maybe look at in the future 
bursting capacity, things like that. And, and the notion of the hybrid cloud, we're not there, but those are things that we kind of consider in looking at directions that we could go in. So, so tell us a little bit more about your, your environment um, to the extent that you can. You have like a billion servers and 80,000 <laughs> people in IT. <laughs> share with us the, if you can paint a picture in whatever detail you can share. So uh, as far as this organization, the, uh, Let's start at the infrastructure and servers. Uh, I know we've just crossed around 22,000 virtual machines. Uh, considering we didn't have the first one in production three years ago, that's been a big ramp up. Uh, so it's been an interesting challenge there. So we've got about seven, 8,000 people in IT, uh, depending. And uh, we're located predominantly in the US, but we do have offices uh, around the world. But for IT, we're focused in a couple areas in Europe and Asia as well. So it's a global problem and a challenge to coordinate all that together. And, and, and how, you know, what degree of virtualized are you? So we're about 80% there on this journey, and uh, we're tackling the higher, harder end workloads now, trying to go after, uh, keep pushing the envelope to see what we can virtualize. So are, are you pushing towards that 100% fully virtualized environment, or are there certain pieces that you don't think will get there in your I, environment? I mean, I'm not sure we'll get there as in an environment as large and as complex as we have, but we are definitely trying to virtualize as much as we can. Uh, there are huge benefits we've seen in terms of agility, flexibility, uh, savings, and, and power savings. Even how you know, we run our data center in terms of the power implications of things like that. Um, it's been a huge win for us. Okay. Can you talk yeah. us a little bit about what has virtualization done to your storage and networking pieces of the stack? Uh, like everyone else, I think we, we've bought more storage uh, due to virtualization, which has been an interesting, uh, we saw this coming, but it's, it's something to keep up with and a growth trend. More storage, the networking, I think we're currently facing the same challenges a lot of people have. Uh, has, virtualization puts more pressure on our network to move faster. Uh, once the server has been virtualized and we can do a lot of our automation there, the, the same level is expected from networking, from storage. How do we do those same things and, and achieve the same agility and speed that we have in uh, server virtualization with networking and storage? So it's been an interesting so, so problem. So what applications aren't you virtualizing? You talked about before? Um, some of our larger, I mean, we have a lot of custom written applications. Some of our larger ones are, are not. They're proprietary to us and unique to our business um, and very critical. And some of our larger workloads, uh, large database workloads, uh, we don't feel like they're a fit right now, but there's something we're still looking at. So you at. want to run those on bare metal? And they are today still. Yeah. So. Right, okay. So, um, now, so let's talk a little bit more about, about, about storage and, and software-defined storage since you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to unpack that, that concept. So first of all, software-defined storage, I mean, to a practitioner, it's like you're laughing, it's kind of an you know, industry buzzword, but, but th there is some meaning uh, to it, right? I mean, software-led, you know, you know, we, we would call it. But, so take us through um, that part of your infrastructure, where you're actually using, so you're a left-hand Long-time left-hand customer, is that correct? Uh, we've been using left-hand actually about three years, so okay, not so, that long. So but not that long, but, but that was a left-hand, that that's a left-hand array, yes? Yes, okay. uh, we started with the physical implementations, and uh, we the VSA has always been interesting to us. Uh, so we've used it internally. Uh, we started using it as a training mechanism. Said, okay, to bring a new storage array or a new storage platform in, uh, you can't just have multiple storage arrays sitting around for people to learn on. But the VSA allowed us to go spin up uh, you know, virtual environments for the SAN administrators to go practice on and you know, give them a sandbox to play in so that the first time they were doing these configurations or changes, it wasn't like they were working on production. You know, so it kind of gives them the net to practice with for their, their tightrope routine kind of thing. So okay. that's what we started with that and we've looked at extending that in a couple small remote locations. We have areas where uh, traditional SAN's not very practical. Uh, we have a lot of remote locations given as many different uh, areas as we serve in the world. And we looked at it for places like that. And the, the interesting dynamic that we give, specifically with left hand, is it's the same operational model. So if we have this in our data center, and it's one way to operate it, and we have it in a remote location, uh, the way you manage it and the way you, you, your operations are the same. It's been a huge win there. Okay, so, so using it for remote locations, and, and these, are, these are locations that are IT light? Uh, in terms of skill sets, is that right? Uh, we don't have a lot of skill set there. In some places, it can be uh, you know almost a, a big wiring closet and, and things like yeah. So there are not a lot of staff there. Uh, not a raised floor. So no raised floor. Water again, cooled. Yes, yeah. uh, so this is given <laughs> a chance. Weber AC. No. Just okay. to go and and put the VSA in a small location and say, okay, we can solve your problem, 
and we can still keep you consistent in that enterprise vision of the things that we need, some of the advanced storage services. You're, you may need snapshots. We have the same replication. So we don't have a lot of different technology, even though the demands for the business are, I need it to be low cost here. I can maybe focus that low cost VSA or you know, remote locations, but you still, you're not sacrificing availability, you're not sacrificing and learning a new different operating model. So we have people that can operate in different areas of these business, the business uh, by keeping the technology consistent that way. So when you go to that, that software-based storage in that, in that remote office, what are the requirements of the, I said, we said it, we call it IT light from a skill set standpoint, but what are the skill sets that you need there? So most of those, uh, they are very light, but in some of them, they may be remote locations with file print services, uh, you know, light workloads, office type workloads. It hasn't been anything very demanding at this point. So as far as that, we may have a couple of servers in a wiring closet, you know, three servers sitting back there, and we could deploy the VSA. Uh, we are, they are virtualized because they were looking to uh, consolidate they had a couple of physical servers and as storage, uh, as refresh just came up for the server hardware, consolidated into one platform. It's still mostly, like I said, file print servers, things like that, but it allows them to run other workloads there if they need to and uh, still get the same level of availability. From a practitioner perspective, sh shouldn't all storage eventually be software led? I mean, don't you want that I, to be I, the case? Or why, why have any hardware in there other than the server? I like that idea a lot. Um, one thing, it kind of divorces the innovation cycle. I think you, know, you can look at your storage services from the hardware cycle, which is rapidly changing. So you don't have to wait you know, a three year cycle or whatever for a hardware or a traditional storage array to incorporate you know, some new technology that's out there. The latest and greatest right. Intel. So you can, you, your performance actually ends up being an interesting curve that we're seeing in terms of uh, faster performance quicker, with, just with the hardware acceleration that comes out due to Moore's Law. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Chris, sorry. Uh, Chris can, you, can you walk us through, you know, you talked to us that uh, when you went highly virtualized that had kind of a growth effect on storage. Um, you know, when you, when you put the, the virtualized storage in place, did that have any effect back on kind of your VM architecture and your the rest of your infrastructure? Sure, one of the first big things that we see out of there is, uh, I think there's been a sawtooth graph I've seen a couple of times at the conference that shows, you know, when you're in kind of a traditional storage array, you have a huge kind of upfront cost, which gets lower over time, but going with a, a virtualized storage approach, and you're solving software-defined storage, that price curve ends up being a lot more linear. Every server you put in adds some network, compute, and storage. So it ends up being a, a much more linear in price curve to allow for the growth. And uh, when you're in a highly virtualized environment and you don't quite know the demands the business is going to place on you, that's a great thing to have, to be able to scale out and keep growing just by adding more servers, and then also to have that in a controlled price point. All right, what, what about things like VM density and your power consumption, you know, how, how does that impact it? Uh, power consumption is something that we look at very heavily, uh, especially in, in my area, it's geared a lot more toward the infrastructure side. So uh, we've seen a pretty large reduction in power usage by going with a software-defined storage approach. Part of that is you've already paid kind of the power penalty for the server, and it's already drawing some power, and you're not drawing a lot extra. Adding the drives is not a significant increase. So that's been a, a very good uh, win and we've seen uh, basically we're already pretty high compression ratio, so it, it supports the densities that we're looking at is the big thing. So, what's um, Chris, what's on the vendors' to-do list? You know, generally HP specifically, kinds of things they can do to to make your life easier, things they can do to you know not tick you off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, luckily, we work very closely with them and have a great relationship. So. Uh, Them being HP, HP or HP. vendors in general, okay. Uh, well, well, a lot of our big vendors, we have uh, a lot. You have a lot close, of vendors. Close yeah. relationships with, yes. <laughs> um, but looking at that, I think the biggest thing, and, and we see this emerging now, is allowing for more automation. Uh, you know, especially, the VMware did a great job with the servers and uh, allowing you know, automation, but as we extend this, you know, improving the automation, trying to help us with this rapid scaling, and letting us work in this, in this virtualized world. Certain vendors, I think, are, are definitely on that track. Other vendors are, are kind of a little more hesitant to figure out how that disrupts maybe their current business model. But uh, really helping us along that area is probably the biggest challenge that we have right now, or the biggest you know, thing we work with our vendors on is about how can we consume this in a much more automated fashion and, and have it deployed quicker. Awesome. 
All right, Crystal, listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and sharing the, the FedEx experiences and your, uh, your practitioner expertise. Good luck going forward, and uh, here's to envisioning an all software-defined world. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and Stu, thank you very much for sitting in with me. All right, everybody, keep it right there. We're back. Stu and I will be back up to wrap. Uh, John Furrier is actually on his way to AT&T Park. Uh, we'll be there tonight broadcasting live, so, so stay tuned to theCUBE and siliconangle.tv. We'll be right back after this.